Oh, Martin's another cavity nester. This is one of those birds that again uh, plummeted over the years. And um, Dick here was one of the founders of Bra when he worked with the DNR. He's gotten into doing purple martins. And I, I even see him down in the Madison area in the summertime working with the uh, people that have martin colonies down there. And he's banding purple martins. And he's retired from the DNR. And he's going to give us a nice talk on purple martins. They're a little more expensive than bluebirds, but when I had them, I loved it. I, I, when I lived in Stoughton, I had a purple martin box and never had a mosquito. Okay. Dick Nicklein. Thank you. I want to get this on. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I have a loud voice anyhow. At least that's what my wife says. First of all, uh, I've been uh, doing purple martins. Uh, I will. The, the top of the microphone was very loose, so by the way. Thank you for all coming here. First of all, I've been dealing with Purple Martins since the age of five years of age. So a long time. Uh, I was the state expert uh, on Purple Martins out there uh, while I worked for the Department of Natural Resources. Today I'm going to talk a whole series of things out there, but my introduction is specifically looking at how we can get people out there. The lady here in the photo, uh, She's from Lake uh, Geneva. And I was called down there to assist them in their bird city when it was you know, inaugural uh, and help them uh, along the way for Purple Martins and placing up Purple Martin housing. Uh, Sarah McConnell uh, is just a super lady as well as all the people down there. The bigger item is, it's sort of what I do with the Wisconsin Purple Martin Association. We mentor people across all of Wisconsin and try to get people to do the right things out of that. What I want to cover today are basic things, as well as go into depth of various other things. I want to talk about ecology of Purple Martins, their habitat. I also want to talk about their housing and attracting uh, the birds themselves. In climate weather, I have a segment out there. I want to talk a little bit about monitoring, which is an on the soft slide. Uh, but I also want to talk about research that I've been doing or research that others that have done. And if you can wait for your questions at the end, because I probably will answer your questions as I go along. There's a lot of information we're going to cover. First of all, purple martins are the largest of all swallows. They're approximately seven to eight inches overall in length. They weigh uh, about 60 grams or 2.5 ounces uh, for most of us out there. They are secondary cavity nesters and that means that they have to have cavities specifically hollowed out or built for them in order to uh, nest out there. They are colonial, that means they like their own members of their own species out there, uh, and that's part of the reason why we like them. Uh, they feed solely on insects, and those insects are generally have to be flying, and keep that in mind. They love open habitat, wetlands are a key factor out there, and I'll be using some terminology today, like ASYs, and that means after second year birds, and SYs, second year birds. Second year birds are one year old birds that were born last year. So keep that in mind as I go along the way. First of all, purple martins begin their nesting season roughly around May 10th within Wisconsin itself and go all the way through August 1. Now those are approximate time periods and I'll go and detail some more things later on. They lay from one to eight eggs out there and specifically 
one to six eggs for second year birds and up to eight eggs in the nest for ASY birds. Incubation is approximately 16 days and sometimes that is weather dependent. So if you have cold weather, incubation is a little longer. If you have real hot weather, such as in 1988, when we had drought, I mean a lot of hot, it was much earlier. So that is very important to know. Uh, and nestlings, uh, when they're in the nest, they range anywhere from 24 days to about 34, uh, sometimes even longer, but the average is about 28 days in the nest. They only have one brood per year. This is uh, from uh, eBird, uh, where they exist throughout North America as well as South America, where they go. Uh, this is a neotropical migrant, so they migrate long distance, up to 5,000 miles. They're also one of the earliest birds to return of those neotropical migrants out there. There are three subspecies of purple martins uh, in North America. One is the Arbicola up in the Northwest. They continue to nest uh, in what we call old growth timber. And only recently, those particular birds have been encouraged to go into uh, housing. In the Southwest, we have, we have Hesperica, and uh, those birds nest in cacti. And so they have a much rougher climate. Their numbers are much lower out there, and very little is known about those birds. The eastern population of uh, purple martins or, or Subas, uh, they are one of three species that are solely dependent upon man for their housing. The other two are martin swallows and chimney swifts. As I mentioned, uh, purple martins go all the way down to South America. Where you see in South America, that little uh, area down there where it's green, that's along the Amazon River. And that's one of the key areas where they go down into. We're gonna look at, from a historical standpoint, for purple martins. Purple martins used to nest, or at least our purple martins used to nest here in the eastern portion of the US uh, in tree cavities. But it was a special group of individuals out there through their process that encouraged purple martins to nest with them, Native Americans. So over thousands of years with Native Americans, they began to build an association where these birds were looking for places specifically for humans. And that was a very key element when our settlers came across after, quote unquote, Columbus uh, discovered America. Uh, but as these European settlers came across, Native Americans showed them what, how, what and how to go about attracting purple martins. And that set a sequence over hundreds of years now has transformed the species where they're solely dependent upon us. So every time you see an individual purple martin out there, that means that it came from somebody's backyard or from a public colony out there that somebody managed. And that's really the importance out there. Otherwise, the species would not be here in the eastern uh, uh, US. I want to give you uh, some clues in, in, in regards to where space requirements are. Note again, they love human habitation. And so housing needs to be placed within 30 feet of, of a home or out as far as 120 to 140 feet away. Or if you have a warehouse or a business where they get to see people. Those are important things to note 
because you can't stick them out in the back 40, especially in Wisconsin, I can tell you that. In addition, you must also be able to keep your housing away from trees, about 40 feet. And the height of that housing needs to be between 12 and 20 plus feet, depending on what trees are surrounding that 40 feet away. I want to give you some clues of what they look like. Lots of people really don't know what they look like because uh, they think tree swallows are purple martins. And so I want to let you know, the upper left here is an ASY male. That's what it gets its name from, but they're actually more bluish than purple. And when you hold them in hand, that, that purple or bluish tinge out there uh, is just more uh, expounded. The bird in the upper right is an ASY female. And again, that bird is two plus years uh, and older. The important thing is look at the tail feathers underneath what we call the tail coverts. It's modeled. And that's how you can readily identify the female most of the, of the time because second year males have modeling, which is the bird over in the lower right. Purple martin males, second years, uh, have at least one purple feather. And I've been banding purple martins. I had one bird one time had one purple feather on it. And it was near, closer to its wing. And when you have to find and look at a bird when it's being let's say transforming from the air into a cavity, you have to be very quick in identifying birds. The bird on the lower left is a second year female. The important thing to look at the bird, it's much lighter feathers, but look at the tail again. It's almost pure white. As the season goes on, that tail actually where the the central part of the feather or, or axis of that feather is, is gets browner. It actually, to me, it gets browner and a little wider because of whatever circumstance uh, uh, from the bird itself. And the last thing to look at is, of course, uh, the young in the nest. And typically, how you can identify them as, after they fledge is they have a yellow or an orangey what I call lips or where their bills are towards the, the face of, of the bird itself. The bird, those little baby birds, they're about 10 days of age, by the way. To give a closer look at the purple martins, uh, they have fish eyes, or what I call fish eyes. Uh, they can see uh, approximately about 270 degrees. And so you gotta imagine this bird about 300 uh, to 600 feet up as they search for their prey out there, which is flying, and they have to be able to uh, grab that. They also have a nictating membrane over their eyes so it can blink and, and create moisture across the eye. Uh, there's pollen, and there's all kinds of things that this bird has to pass through uh, and affects the eye. So it's very important for the bird to be able to, to see out there. In front of the eye, notice it's just like baseball players, uh, soccer players, uh, as well as football, football players. Uh, you have a dark area there, that helps con control the glare of the bird uh, when it looks out in blue sky. The bird feeds on a whole host of uh, insects, Japanese beetles, Buckeye butterflies, painted ladies, uh, bee flies, morning cloaks, damselflies, flying ants, carpenter ants, dragonflies, and of course in our region here, what is called light flies or midges. Uh, they feed on mayflies and many other uh, species out there. And as the season goes on, uh, it can be uh, into caddisflies. No mosquitoes are very few mosquitoes, I want to tell you that. 
housing. Uh, it can be a uh, plastic, it can be a uh, wood, uh, it can be a hybrid of those, now poly, wood. Uh, but the important things as we look at it, these are what we call for modern housing, six by 12 compartment size or six by 10 compartment size. They're much larger than the original housing that was created in the 60s by manufacturers out there, which were six by six by six. Reason for that, you have four, six, or eight, up to eight individuals that go in there and they're big birds by the time they migrate. Okay, most housing uh, can be either round holes, or crescent holes, and some of our display uh, that I brought along uh, are what we call Connolly or slotted openings out there. And those slotted openings can be modified even on that. The reason for the crescents out there is to prevent starlings from going in there, or the Connellys. And so that's one species that you don't have to worry about as much. About 95% of the starlings are, are taken into account by that design. Anything I tell you today, always look at, if you always heard something that is this way, I can tell you along the way, it never is that way. <laughs> it really is not. Uh, Purple Martins as well as other birds out there, including bluebirds, always go beyond. That's the easiest that I can say. It, again, the crescent holes there, but notice there are horizontal guards and vertical guards uh, out there uh, as well. A house has to have, whether it's the guard or a wooden house, has to have access. In order to keep your colonies, you need to be able to monitor it. And I keep stressing that. Most people want to just put it up and forget it. Your colony may never last more than that one year out there if you go that way. We are, there's also what we call insulation in the attic uh, for T14s to keep the house cooler or keep the house warmer, depending on the type of season that you may have as well as, again, the access points out there of the housing. And most of all, Purple Mortons love purchase. And without purchase uh, out there, that these birds themselves actually will decline some places where people just only put up the housing. You also have to be able to raise and lower that house vertically through a winch or a lanard of some sort has to go up and down vertically. And when you have a winch or even a lanard, you have to be cautious. Over my lifetime I'm looking for and raising lower purple martin houses out there, uh, I've had uh, instances of where the house, the cable is broke or the lanard is broke, and you have to look out for your safety along the way. Literally, the house goes down over well over 100 miles an hour. This is our colony over at High Cliff State Park. Notice the variety of cavities, the variety of openings on the housing out there. Notice what's below the house. We have a predator guard, so if any critters uh, that are mammalian can't get up there, and that's very important along the way. But more importantly, look at where the birds can perch. There are wetlands, Lake Winnebago's on one side, and there's several ponds on the other side. And those are key factors always out there. But that's solely a, a factor for purple martins. The cavities themselves are pull out. That's what I would recommend for people. They don't have to be, but then you'll have to clean up uh, your, your cavities in, in the wooden house or the guards or whatever it may be. But you're trying to make it as accommodating for you to monitor the housing out there. And the stress of monitoring housing out there is every three to five days. Eggs are laid every day. You need to know when those eggs are laid so you can calculate 
or to learn when the bird is going to have its young hatching. That's important as part of that process. Yes, it's more work, but you want your birds to be there and they're dependent on you, as I said before. What I want to show you is, is a couple key elements that colonies are lost. And these were all colonies out here that people had their success and with time lost all their colonies. This has happened since I was at Appleton. So I just want to let you know, and I was at Appleton from 1980 onward, where I still live. And you can easily see the reasons why just by the picture itself. But what I want to talk about is, even when I tell people and show people, they still place the housing in wrong sites. Mm -hmm. So there's one, and there's another. This individual, actually it's more than an individual, it's actually an organization out there, uh, up in Door County. But they've been waiting for eight years to have purple martins. Common predators, much just like bluebirds, sparrows and starlings. This spring, we actually, in one of our houses out there, where we had one of those crescents, we had a pair of starlings come in where uh, a pair of martins, they killed both of those martins. And so there's always those occasions that you absolutely have to look at your, your compartments and take care of the problems. <clears throat> raccoons, I want to stress raccoons uh, out there when I was working uh, or doing things with bra, raccoons uh, the largest one in the state was uh, captured and, and uh, trapped in Douglas County, weighed 90 some pounds. <laughs> so, when you think uh, uh, of a critter out there, you better beware all the time that some critter will bypass your predator guards or bypass anything that you place out there. We put things on housing. And that's one of the key items that uh, I stressed at our conference uh, this past summer. We have to think like the birds, not think like humans. And once when you do that, then you realize that, that critters and other things happen when you don't realize it. Raccoon in Minneapolis uh, or St. Paul, I think it was two years ago, climbed 20 stories off a building. It took two days. That's how powerful a critter can be, especially if they have whatever inside is out there. Cooper's hawks, shark shin hawks, uh, as well as barred owls and great horned owls are also predators uh, for purple martins. Black rat snakes, maybe not up here in Green Bay area, but in southwestern Wisconsin, uh, are certainly an impact. In the last few years that I worked for the state, well, in Appleton, we actually had numbers of people come in almost every year that brought a dead black rat snake in because they were visiting in Illinois uh, or while they were traveling northward, poor snake uh, didn't make it because once when somebody seen it, uh, there was chaos on the roadside. Uh, they usually ended up uh, killing uh, uh, the snake. And more recently, uh, we have herring gulls uh, as well as ring gull, uh, gulls are uh, predators on them. I want to give you a perspective of where in the state uh, that is looking at habitat. The key habitat, uh, as I press the button, will come up. And that's really where purple martins reside right now. It's agricultural lands, it's grasslands, and it's where what we call wetlands that could be open water. I want to give you an insight about trends out there. Uh, the illusion earlier in my introduction, uh, 
covered a little bit about this. Purple hornets are declining, actually all aerial insectivores are, are declining out there rapidly. This is Bird Atlas 1. Take special note where all the black dots, black dots are, but more importantly, take note where there's green and not gray. Gray is where all the searches were done in 1995 to 2000. Look at Breeding Bird Atlas 2. Look at how much gray is out there and where purple martins were not seen. Basically, above Highway 64, very few purple martin colonies exist. The difference between those two years, we had about 300 colonies that were reported uh, in the, uh, the Atlas I and Atlas II, about 150 colonies. And that gives you a little bit more insight of what's going on. To look at a different perspective, the Breeding Bird Survey here in Wisconsin. In the upper right, is for uh, US and Canada and Mexico. It's basically flat line with some slight decline out there across the whole US. If you look at the lower left, that's Wisconsin. Pretty sharp. And when you look at the maps right there, anything that's red really tells you where the problem goes uh, with purple martins, which is basically in, in the uh, Great Lakes area. To put it more simple, this is an actual count of people seeing uh, birds or hearing birds on the surveys in Wisconsin. If you look at it where that little square came down, that was 1971, almost 600 birds were spotted or counted. If you look at this next one, that's 2015, 21 on all those routes. That puts it in a little bit more perspective out there. I want to talk a little bit about adverse conditions out there. Over the last decade, we've really had what I call severe weather. I go out and feed purple, purple martin, and you'll see a picture here in a second. But in April, our birds are generally arrive in April. Uh, uh, there is that one previous slide said April 5th is the average. But just imagine and take a, a look back at 2018. Within Wisconsin, we had 20 to 30 inches of, of snow that fell on April 20th. We had 26 martins that day. They came that day as it was going from rain to sleet to snow. When it's time for purple martins to come, they come. Many years uh, over the last decade, we fed purple martins from 20 to, uh, I think 2014 and 2017 were our worst years out there where it was well into mid-May before we ended up uh, uh, quitting the, when the weather got a little better out there. When the birds reach in the 40s, lower 40s uh, for gram weight out there, they're starving. And it's very easy to, to tell those birds. They're, they look unkempt. Over the last decade, what's happened to purple martins during the summertime. We've especially had what we call hot weather, and then it turns cold in the middle of the summer. And especially in 2019, 2017, 2014, uh, including even this past year in 2022 and 2021, where you go from 90 degrees down to the 50s and 60s with a cold front that came through. That is drastic. Insects do not fly when it's about 50 degrees. And so think about it. You lost all your food resources out there and you have to feed your young in this pink stage. And so they're out searching for their young itself. The young are exposed to the cold. The 
because of the time that the adults are, are off feeding, the adults also have to care for themselves equally at the same time. You lost your mic. Did I? Okay. Uh, there. Back again? Back again? There. Too many things here. So, basically, when you don't have insects, lots of parts are, are affected out there. Your housing, many times, they can sit on the eggs, they can sit on, on the birds to brood them, but basically, it's an impact to those birds, and you end up with losses. In some years, we lose only a third of our birds, some years we lose half of our birds, and sometimes we lose three quarters of our birds, depending on the duration of those. In 2014, it was one of those times, as well as 2017. Tell you a little bit about the research that I've been doing. Actually, I'm a master bander, so anytime you're touching a band, you're doing research out there. I put color bands on uh, across the whole state. You can see some photos uh, or, or pictures in, the, in the, uh, the future here. But more importantly, is to help people better see bands on birds, or at least we thought. I put about 500 on birds between 2018 and 2019. Out of those, I uh, found all of, or approximately five of those birds and only two were cited by the general public. And so part of this whole session today is to get you to look at martins or other birds and look for bands out there. That's the key. And since I've been doing that uh, since 2018 in a more conservative effort out there, we've had more returns. My returns used to be about one every other year. When I started doing more education in the 80s and 90s, then it started maybe one a year. In the last four years, especially 2022, I've had 20, 12 reports. And so the effort is there. Anytime you walk a road, anytime you walk a street, anytime you're driving a road, there's a dead bird out there. If you don't mind, stop and look at it, especially if it's in good condition. You'd be surprised how often you find birds with bands. There's well over a million birds banded each and every year. And think about that. The bulk of those are passerines. And waterfowl, as well as the what I call the classical species out there, are the key items that people report. Sand crane, eagles, as I said, raptors of, of all sorts. Uh, but bluebirds, passerines, robins, they report lots. So my pitch right there. It, again, this is what the color band looks like from a second year bird. I've also been involved with putting transmitters on birds. And transmitters uh, cost a lot of money, about 500 and plus dollars per transmitter out there. And they weigh about one gram on a 60 gram bird. And so it gives you better clues along the way uh, that the bird can be able to uh, have them on, on them without any uh, dress. Uh, the problem is, again, much the same way, we have to capture those birds again and or have somebody find a dead bird out there. And out of the 11 that I placed out there in the last couple of years, uh, it's a problem with chips, and so that has created some problems along the way. But the two returns that I have have turned up zero information. And part of that is one of the birds were, were found, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future slide, but the bird that I recaptured out there, I downloaded or attempted to, uh, to download the data, and I couldn't, sent it to the Purple Market Conservation Association out in Erie. They couldn't download it, and it was sent to the manufacturer, 
that was the first and only time that they ever had a transmitter fail. Oh, so, so I just wanted to let you know, we're trying to learn information why performance <laughs> are, are declining. And that's really my whole entire goal. We also put, when we put transmitters on, the birds are also color coded on the aluminum band, we paint them orange to give extra looks on there. And I can tell you this, after 10,000 miles of migration, they're hard to see. They truly are. Uh, even with the orange on it, and, as well as the uh, uh, red uh, uh, color bands. I've covered the whole state looking for uh, embanding purple martins out there. I can tell. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to show you out here. There, there's at least 14 common sites that I consistently have gone to uh, across the state. So it isn't just in Northeast Wisconsin. I try to do it where the birds are. But one more important thing along the way is over the course of about 2020, 2002, I've been looking for a purple mark roost uh, out there across this state that showed up on radar. And through time, it took me uh, approximately 15 years to find the roost in, in this concentration out there. And you don't think you can lose 30,000 plus birds out there uh, where nobody can uh, find them or know where they're at. Well, that's how long it took in order to find those birds because they can disappear in front of your eyes. And I'll show you in a little bit. I also uh, don't do uh, lots of fancy things because everything you do when you're out there banding takes time. And we also have to take care of purple martin colonies ourselves. But what I want you to look at is the various bar graphs out there. And each year is not the same. The bird's weight changes all the time by the age as well as by sex. And part of that uh, it was indicated earlier due to weather problems out there uh, as well as other, uh, other significant aspects of which wind is really a key factor along with the cold. Better looking at it from the season, you go from 60 plus grams all the way down to about 50 grams. And that's the average. I just want to point that out. That's the average. So there are a lot of birds that are below 50 grams that we have out there. 2022s, I haven't compiled as of this point. The percent of your colony. It's primarily once in your colony gets established after four or five years. Uh, is composed of 65 to 70 percent of ASY birds and 30 to 35 percent of second year birds. That's ideally. It goes up and down when you look at across the chart there, look at 2008, notice that there's only about 13 percent out there of second year birds. And when you have that, that's never a good sign out there a long way because you're relying on those second year birds to come back and roughly 50% on the average of your adult birds do not make it back. So you have a turnover all the time. The average age uh, of a purple martin is roughly 2.8 uh, years uh, of age out there. So they have to reproduce themselves in basically in a short time out there. Eggs that they lay, and in particular, this is the average of, of both ASYs as well as second year birds, and then I'll have a couple charts on uh, ASYs. But the common eggs laid again is shown there about the average for for all martins is roughly five, roughly about four bird or four eggs per bird uh, are hatched, and about three young fledge from those eggs. 
another chart that goes through and you notice the, the trend mark from right to left uh, showing the years is downward. Uh, uh, approximately, if you look at uh, the chart, this again for ASYs, but I'm going to talk in general for, for the whole range out there. You generally have uh, about 80% or greater for hatching, and that's usually about 87. 80% of uh, the uh, young that hatch out there, uh, that make it to flight, and from eggs to flight is about 70%. And those are just generalizations. There are albino purple martins out there. Uh, remember my age uh, that I had indicated to you previously. Uh, in all the thousands of uh, purple martins that I've banded, which is over 20,000 uh, out there, it took until 2020 before the first albino uh, that I seen or somebody reported to me across Wisconsin. And it just so happens there were two opportunities in 2020 that were only about 30 miles apart. And for this audience, if you have a purple martin colony or know of people who have purple martin colonies, I'm interested in albina birds. And if you notice, there's a color band on this, uh, as well as all its siblings. And I have, generally, they are much better showing up in somebody's colony where people notice them, uh, the siblings, uh, at least I'm hoping, uh, or uh, the albino, uh, would be this coming year which would have been 2022 or 2023. Uh, so, but the more important thing, it does occur, and it's a very rare event. To give you a clue, when the first dot comes down on the map, that's High Cliff State Park. I also did banding uh, for about 10 years down in Greenback, but I'm concentrating on High Cliff. That yellow circle that just came down is 25 miles, And the second circle that came down is 50 miles. Generally, within 50 miles of your colony, that's where the bulk of those second year birds come back. I mentioned that 50% of the adults do not make it back each, each and every year. But for, sec or for fledglings from this year, only about 27% of those fledglings will survive. And then you'll see a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, dots drop down. In particular, the, the one that I'm going to note more is a bird where the black dot is by Pewaukee, uh, down there uh, near Milwaukee. The reason this bird, uh, uh, let's say, was recaptured or, or seen by an individual, it was a live bird, by the way. The bird spent eight years prior to that at High Cliff State Park and as an adult ASY. Why it left is beyond me, but birds choose to leave, whether it's weather conditions, they weren't successful, or whatever it may be, may be part of the outlook out there. Maybe it found a different mate. Who knows what reasons are the bird cannot tell us in, in, in English, I guess, uh, what really the reason is why. I also have caught two birds from Ontario that were, were uh, banded as youngsters and they came to survive or live at High Cliff State Park. One for several years uh, and the other one only uh, one year. And then the latest here is that there was two dots that dropped uh, down. Remember when I was talking about a transmitter? It was at Shelbyville, Tennessee. That's where it was found by an individual down there. Uh, the bird banding lab sent me a note specifically 
Uh, I called the person right away. The secretary said, he will give you a call back. Well, I'm still waiting for that call. I've had other people who were down there attempt to do the same uh, over the course of whatever time period. That transmitter uh, is completely lost, uh, and that's what I passed on to the secretary, to, to the, uh, the company there, uh, so that they would know. And part of the problem, I think, occurred that year. Uh, the Martin was recovered, uh, by the way, in September 1, and I, I put a transmitter on it in July. And so I lost the data from that where it went from the house were in Sherwood to maybe a roost area, and those are key things that I'm looking at uh, from a, a long term where we need to protect. The other bird was down near New Orleans, and that was the first time that I really had a really a long distance uh, return, which is over a thousand miles. I want to talk a little bit about looking at nationally. Uh, and you'll see a purple line go around. Uh, the earliest ever coming here into Dane County, Wisconsin, for Purple Martins arriving is March 13th. Mm -hmm. The latest leave in Wisconsin is in Manitowoc County, mm -hmm. which was October 24th. And so just because the general birds are gone doesn't mean that they are truly gone. And I always tell people, leave your housing up until September 15th. That's generally a, a better date than taking down and cleaning your housing because you may uh, have some visitors come along the way. The other key item that I want to point out is the only large concentration of Purple Martins was in Oconto County in 1973 by Tom Erdman, who was from Green Bay uh, himself and working with the UW. It's amazing that it wasn't recorded thereafter, and that's why I said before, you can't believe that thousands of Purple Martins can disappear before people's eyes, but they do. In, 19, or 19, in, in, in 2018, I was privileged to be out at the right time when the birds hit the roost area out there. There was about 86,000 purple martins came into this roost on that particular day. There was also a total of about 250,000 aerial insectivores. Again, looking at why people haven't reported that previously, it goes back to near sunset, the timing uh, of the day, it's on a lake, access all of those but i spent 15 years talking to people surrounding all of this and yes they see the birds but they did not see where they went and just recently i want to give you another look at it because this year i had seen about 90,000 purple martins at their peak i'm getting done so be aware uh, <laughs> The key item that what I'm trying to provide to all of you is to show you where there are public colonies. At our display over there, uh, there's 19 places across the state that we have important. The reason why I do that is where people are, they can see those colonies. There's usually a volunteer taking care of the colonies. And since they're public uh, out there, they're less apt to go defunct private colonies, we have owners change all the time. We want to see permanent colonies so that if you put up a housing, there's a greater chance that you can secure birds, and that's really part of our goal. The other end that I make comment all the time, even at our own conference, lots of people don't bring their kids or grandkids to these conferences. There's plenty of things you can do with them uh, along the way. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we uh, as groups are uh, out there, we don't do enough. 
is encourage kids to come along in any fashion out there. Who's going to replace us? I have a person replacing me, but he's 50 plus. I'm 70. We'll be 71 next month. Who's going to replace us? And that's what I want to keep in the forefront. Education is a key factor. Anytime I can have kids out there and feel and touch birds, that hooks them. The parents come back at our colony all the time. We have people all over the world come to High Cliff State Park, and we have big impacts out there. And that's it. Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, the question is, uh, I didn't mention about Amish uh, uh, farmers uh, or Mennonite farmers at, at all, but I work closely with them, uh, especially down in uh, Columbia, uh, Green Lake, and uh, Marquette counties, uh, as well as up by me in Manitowoc County, we have uh, both Amish and Mennonites. In Calumet County, we have both. Uh, my hometown is Colby, they're over there, so I also work with them uh, constantly out there. They are people of the land and they have lots of kids. And their kids certainly monitor the housing. And so whenever we have an opportunity to ban for them, uh, we try to involve them all the time. If you have any Kids, I don't remember how many I have from, from uh, our conference in the summer, but I have buttons. And so if you have kids or grandkids, I'm willing to give you a button uh, to give to them to promote Purple Martin Conservation. When I had Purple Martins at Stoughton, a neighbor complained that they were too noisy. How do you quiet them down? <laughs> I appreciate everybody saying they eat a lot of mosquitoes. But now you said that they weren't on that. <laughs> I don't have the problem anymore, but. Okay. Uh, did everybody hear that question? Uh, uh, he uh, said that Purple Martin's too loud. Yes, it can be too loud. Uh, we're, we have our colony at High Cliff State Park. The individual there who I got to know uh, as a neighbor of my wife's family when I was dating her in Milwaukee. Long story, and I made it short. Anyway, I got to know him when he was in his 50s, uh, actually 40s and 50s, and then when I came up in the Appleton area, I got to know him very well. He died at 98, and uh, he died carrying his quarter of his Purple Martin house out there. He ended up with a heart attack. Etc. But he did what he liked. So, what I did with his colony is encourage them to disperse his birds. He had 250 pairs. So, think about that. If you have an average of four young, that's a thousand young plus another 200 or 500 uh, adults, and that's a lot of noise. And a lot of noise brings a lot of predators, but it also brings complaints. So we ended up dispersing this colony, going to High Cliff, but also about 20 neighbors out there, and it's not as loud now. And so that's one way that you can uh, deal with those situations. And it looks like yeah, Steve is very anxious to go. Things so are going to be around, so you're going to have to 